is a tool that God has given us to, to live a victorious Christian life and an experience with Him. And You know, what we want you to know and understand here at Christian Life Center is that because of, of our hearts being surrendered to God in worship, when we do that, God meets with us in a special way. It's not about a location. It's not within the four walls of a building. But the Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And uh, our life groups right now are, are learning about worship and, and the importance of worship. And, and um, you know, I want to encourage you if, you, if you're not in a life group, you need to jump in one because we're learning how intentional worship is. And some of our worship team is actually going to life groups and leading worship. It's a powerful, powerful tool. We're so glad that you chose to join us today at Christian Life Center. I want to say welcome to everyone uh, that's here. If today is your first Sunday to be here, we're so glad that you chose to come and, and join us today in our time of worship to God together. Also, I want to say welcome to everybody that is watching uh, CLC live stream. No matter where you're watching from, we are glad that you're with us. And thank you for joining us today, even though you couldn't be in the building with us. I want to ask you, if you would, to drop down in the comments section and post where it is you're watching from, what community or city or state. Uh, also, if you have a prayer need, you are welcome to post that there uh, in the comments section. Our prayer team would love to pray for you in your life. Well, those of you that are in the building today, um, you got an orange welcome packet when you come in. If you would grab that because inside there are message notes. And uh, you guys know that we've been in this series called Water Walkers. Simply talking about what it means to, to walk on water and the story of of how Peter actually stepped out of the boat, and uh, we're learning more about that today. Um, would you turn to somebody and say, you're a water walker? Tell them, you are a water walker. All of you in the room are. We have to determine if we're going to get out of the boat and walk on water. You know, last Sunday we talked about one of the ways to extend our faith that, that we, we really work on extending our faith is, is in extravagant generosity. <coughs> And you know, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we begin to sing. But as long as we keep our eyes on him, he always guides, directs, and provides in our life. <clears throat> no matter what it is that we're going through, whatever it is we need. Today, we're honored to have my friends that are here with us, a special guest. And um, Karen and I are privileged to have them as our friends. God puts pe people in your life sometimes that <clears throat> excuse me, add value to who you are. We're honored today. Uh, to have with us Jeff and Mary Anderson, and he uh, works with Convoy. We are a partner of Convoy. Today, would you make welcome Pastor Jeff Anderson as he comes? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Eddie. Love you, man. Thank you. Good morning, CLC Rala. Hallelujah. I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say thank you to your pastors for their love their life, their leadership, and the friendship that we enjoy. I know that you enjoy. You are blessed indeed to have the staff, the pastors, and the care that you have here at CLC Rala. Amen? Amen. Thankful for that. I'm also blessed to have somebody by my side. We have been married 33 years in June. Her name is Mary Beth. She's right there on the front row. Wave at everybody, Mary. Give her a hand for being married to me for 33 years, at least, you know. She's amazing. We're blessed. We have three daughters, two son-in-laws, two grandbabies, and a female dog named Zuli. It's insane. So uh, I love my life. I'm thankful for what God has had for us and the calling that he has had on our life, and we're honored to be with you today. Uh, we love this church, and Convoy is honored to be an, a strategic partner of CLC Rala. We are the hands and feet of Jesus extended not only nationally but globally during times of disaster, uh, our feeding programs, our ag programs, our women's empowerment programs, rural compassion right down to the U.S. community events. Uh, we're Jesus with skin on. Say that with me. Jesus with skin on. Oh, you can do better than that. One, two, three. That's pretty much what we do. We show up with help and hope and uh, obviously bring practical help to people, but introduce people to Jesus Christ. One of the goals of Convoy of Hope is to bend the heart of the church towards the poor and suffering. Um, today, is, as we sit here, nearly a billion people live in extreme poverty. 16,000 people will perish today because they do not have access to clean food and uh, uh, to nutritious food and clean drinking water. 
But the other thing that, that really bothers us is people will enter into a Christless eternity without Jesus because they never heard about Christ and his love and the things that we just sang about. Um, I'm so thankful for the worship time. You just led us right into the presence of God. I felt the presence of God, the Holy Spirit here. And how many of you know when God shows up, it's good. His presence is real. And so we're just grateful to be with you today. It's not only to bend the heart of the church towards the poor and suffering, but then bend the heart of the poor and suffering to Jesus. Matthew 25, Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So we show up with practical help. And then that, that compassion and kindness builds a bridge to Matthew 28, which is the Great Commission. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news. And so we want to tell people about Christ. So Matthew 28 involves evangelism and life change. And uh, we're just so thankful today that we're more than a humanitarian organization, but we're distinctively Christian as we approach uh, needs in the world. And our number one partner is the local church. Every place that we go, we're currently deployed in Nebraska, in Mozambique, wrapping up operations in Alabama, and then feeding 200,000 kids in 14 nations every day, the, the hot meal that they'll receive that day. Your one day to feed the world makes all of that possible. So you have a stake in this. So the stories that I tell are your stories. Uh, the message that I bring today, I pray that you receive it. You'll just take it to heart and receive encouragement. So here's the latest video report of Convoy of Hope, all of our initiatives and ministries. Take a look. Extreme poverty is talked about like it's permanent, that it can never be solved. And you make that possible, and we give God the glory for that. Amen? All the numbers that you see and the things, those numbers represent people, and their lives have been changed because of it. So I'm grateful to be with you today. It's our job to take our partners, the prayers of God's people, and multiply that generosity. So we serve a God of multiplication. Uh, then we help as many people as possible. You're not giving to Convoy of Hope, but you're giving through convoy of hope. So when we deploy, we go to a disaster, we're feeding kids every day, we're training women in women's empowerment, we're teaching farmers how to grow more and better food, we're reaching into rural America as well as our U.S. outreaches. All of that is because your generosity, kindness, and partnership make that possible. So we're just so thankful today. These are some of the images uh, taken from some of our recent 
program areas as well as disaster sites. This picture that you're seeing was from Puerto Rico. Uh, the devastation there uh, year, uh, over a year ago now, we're still rebuilding homes there, doing work in that uh, part, of the, part of the world. As well as these next slides, you can see some of the California fires, the images from, from Redding and Paradise. California, we've been deploying water. In fact, we're still uh, sending water up to Flint, Michigan, as we speak. Uh, we are the water source for uh, those disasters and the flooding in Nebraska. We're sending truckloads of water, emergency supplies, flood buckets, hygiene kits, open and eat food to help people right here in the States. Via de Esperanza is the name of this community. Hurricane Maria bore down on Puerto Rico. Uh, that's what was left of the home. That brother owned that home, rode out the hurricane in that home, and uh, his name is Jorge. When he saw Convoy of Hope coming through and my Golden State Warrior hat, hey, don't judge, he ran back into his house, got his Golden State Warrior hat, came out, did a selfie. Right after that selfie, he gave me a gigantic Puerto Rican Big Brother hug and straightened out my spine for life. I no longer need to go to the chiropractor. And uh, Jorge's life was changed. Let me tell you his story. His wife and three teenage boys left they went to a safe place where he decided he didn't want his house looted if and when his house would take a hit. His house took a direct hit, destroyed his home. He was injured in the process. The first organization that rolled through his community was Convoy of Hope, led by Pastor Elvis, one of the local pastors there. We work with his church. His name really is Elvis. And he was so thankful. He came up and he said, you work with Convoy of Hope? I said, yeah. He said, you guys brought food. You brought Luminade, solar lamps to us. We could, we could charge items. We could have light. And he said, you brought water to us for months, so thank you. And I said, you're welcome. It's because of one day to feed the world and churches that are generous towards Convoy that we're able to do that. Next slide. <coughs> Lebanon, where it's not supposed to snow this much, and this is a refugee camp. We're supplying blankets, water purification, heating oil. And it got so bad last month that in this part of Lebanon where it's not supposed to snow this much people were burning their clothes to stay warm it's desperate it's dire so disaster response coming in Jesus name really brings help and hope to a lot of people next slide mark 12:30 says love the lord your god with all of your heart with all of your soul with all of your mind and with all of your strength the second is this love your neighbor as yourself there is no commandment greater than these. This morning, your partnership with Convoy to alleviate suffering and poverty is not just making life better for people. And we sang about it. I loved the song that the team led us today, all of the songs, in fact. But you're making the kingdom bigger. And there's a difference. There's a difference of feeding somebody and giving them momentary help and showing kindness. And we believe that's important at Convoy of Hope. But the greatest injustice is doing that without telling people about eternal hope in Jesus Christ. And that is what separates Convoy of Hope from a lot of great humanitarian organizations. And we're not in competition with any of them, and uh, we wouldn't dare do that. We would step up and say, Lord, you have given us a place and a space to serve people in need in Jesus' name. And that's what we're about. Um, the definition of kindness, obviously the quality of being friendly, generous, care, considerate, showing warmth, showing concern, and some people just don't care anymore. You think about this. <clears throat> the word others can trigger a great move of God in your life. And so in your Water Walker series, as Pastor Eddie is leading you and teaching you in this series, obviously I get the great imagery of when Peter got out of the boat and kept his eyes on Jesus and he walked on water. It took great faith. It takes great faith to be generous, to show kindness, to give extravagantly. But as soon as Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, what happened? He started to sink. And that's what happens to us. You look at your circumstances and you take your eyes off Jesus. Your eyes either on the circumstance or on Jesus. It can't be on both. And say, Lord, today you are bigger than the circumstances or need in my life. So this Water Walker series, talking about extravagant generosity and it takes faith to be extravagant. I want to unpack a story for you found in John chapter 6. It's called A Boy's Lunch and a Big God. John 6. Jesus saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. He turned to Philip and he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip. 
for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down. How many of you know sometimes the world says, don't just stand there, do something? And God says, just stand there, let me do something. Let me handle the situation. And that's what Jesus just, just did. He took charge of the situation, verse 12. Verse 11, then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed them to the people, and afterward he did the same with the fish. They all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. May God add his blessing to his word the story that I'm about to share. This passage is powerful. There are between 10 and 13,000 people, uh, scholars and theologians guesstimate uh, with 5,000 men, including women and children, maybe closer to 10 to 15,000. Jesus asked the disciples to feed this crowd. He knew they couldn't do it on their own. I want you to notice that. Jesus knew in advance what he was going to do, but he wanted to stretch their faith and give them an opportunity to participate in the miracle. That is what one day to feed the world does. When you take a day in the next 21 days, you pick that day and say, today I'm working on behalf of the poor and suffering. I'm sanctifying and dedicating this day. Make it a spiritual and holy moment for your family, for your job. You're not just going to work. You're on a mission. And by the way, I was talking to somebody afterwards, and they said, you know, we're very thankful uh, to be able to bless and be generous towards Convoy and entrusting you with finances. And we take that very seriously. And I told this brother, I said, we, we obviously need financial resources, but I said, God doesn't want our money. He wants our life. He wants our heart. Because when he gets that, all, that other th all those other things follow. Amen? God gets your heart. He's got you. And so opportunities to give, opportunities to serve, opportunities to show kindness, opportunities to be extravagant in our giving and generosity. Um, and the Lord knows. He knows your needs. He knows mine. So the disciples wrestled with the practicality question, and we wrestle with this too. Are we supposed to spend that much money? By the way, it was eight months' wages to feed that crowd of people on the hill in, by, by that day's standards. To spend that much money on bread and give it to the crowd that we eat? What's in it for us, Lord? What Jesus said and did following the disciples' honest question provide insight into God's heart concerning our spirituality. I firmly believe this, that we do not have financial problems. We have spiritual problems that affect our finances. So as individuals and as a church, many times we can face life in one of two ways, solve it with our own human logic or turn the whole thing over to God. And that's the the crux of this story. So I love this church because you believe the Bible. You believe in growing. Uh, many of you know that reaching the world and demonstrating the love of God is not an option. Half of the earth uh, went to bed without a clear presentation of the gospel. In our lifetime, in North America, we will hear the gospel preached 1,400 times when 40% of the earth hasn't heard it once. And so you tell me if that looks like justice. It's not. And so today, we're, we're in this mission of not just looking at the miracle, but understanding these principles of why Jesus did what he did. So the first big idea is this. No life or gift is too little or too insignificant. If you're here today, and you would say, you know, what do I really bring to the table, Lord? What, what do you see in me? Well, I love the song, Defender, as we sang it, because God thinks you're pretty important. He placed his spirit in you. He sent his son to die for you. He loves you. He's, we're forgiven today. How many of you know everyone in Rala is forgiven? They just don't know it yet. He said in the first service, make it really hard to go to hell from Rala. If people want to go to hell, they're going to have to move. Because CLC in Rala is saying, hey, we're talking about Jesus here. And Jesus is the answer. So, and we believe that at Convoy of Hope. We believe God's word is truth. It is absolute truth. It speaks to every area of our life. And we believe Jesus is the Savior 
of the world, and we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you're here today, you'd say, you know, what could God possibly do with my life? What could God do with, with my offering, my little offering, my one day's wage, whatever that might be? I want to tell you something today. There's a chain of this wonderful day that we see in this story about this little boy's bag lunch and a big God. First of all, there's a mom who made the lunch. Now, if you're into routine and you got a schedule as we all do, you know, I got a schedule, I got to catch a flight in the morning, 6 a.m., I'll be up at 4, head to the airport, get back to Springfield. So I'm on a schedule this week. It's, it's hard, fast, hard, and tight. But there was a mom who got up this day where this little boy lived and made a lunch. Little did she know that that morning when she was preparing her little boy's lunch, that she was making lunch for the king of kings and ten to 15,000 guests. It's just a lunch, right? It's just the routine. It's what you do. You're responsible. You're doing your responsibilities. You're doing the next right thing. You're doing the next kind thing. But there was a dad. There was a dad who went to work to make the money to buy the groceries to stock the pantry so the mom could make the lunch and give it to the boy only to have that lunch snatched out of his hands in a field by one of Jesus' disciples. Thank you very much. We'll take that. Hey, Jesus, we got us a lunch here. It's about all we could come up with. And I can imagine just this little boy just kind of saying, hey, you know, my mom's not going to believe me. I'm going to get in trouble. This story's not going to hold water. No pun intended. And, and yet there was the boy who gave the lunch. Everybody's part of the miracle. Your part of the miracle. It's not so much what we possess, but who possesses us. Who possesses you today? You know, we're, we're stewards of everything. We're not owners of anything. The breath in our lungs is God-breathed. The jobs, the places, the people, the challenges, the good, the blessings and the battles, obviously God has allowed them. But God is saying when you surrender your resources and your lives, then you become his responsibility. Just like the boy's lunch, when you place your life in God's hands, you become more focused, more purposeful, and more effective in what you do. So by the way, a lunch becomes a feast. A lunch is your lunch in your hands. It's yours. It's good for you. But when you place a lunch in God's hands, it becomes a feast and he multiplies it for thousands. So this morning, trusting God to give. I'm not talking about your tithes. If you're new to the church and giving 10% of our wages for the church, ongoing operation of the church and the kingdom. Actually, the tithe is the Lord's. It's not even yours. When we say, hey, give your tithes, it's not your tithe. It's his tithe. Your offerings are yours. So I'm not talking about giving your tithes. This is beyond. And so what is one day's wage? Jeff, well, it's different for all of us. We all kind of know what we make in a day. And you say, man, Jeff, that's a lot. It's one 240th of your annual wages. The 200 average work, 240 average working days a year. Why one day's wage? Well, here's what we found at Convoy. A lot of churches cast this vision and challenge their people to work one day and give that day's wage on their give Sunday. The next 21 days, you pick a day. You're able to say, hey, this day, when I work for the poor and suffering, God will share his heart with me. He blesses churches. He puts them on a new trajectory of blessing and prosperity. And you say, well, Jeff, wait a second. Are you saying give just to get? Absolutely not. Give to meet the need and do it as unto the Lord. But, but be aware. God says, I will bless you. I will press it down. I will shake it. I will make room for more in your life. And that is the generous God that we serve. So I'm not saying, hey, give to get. But when you give, give with expectation that God is going to take care of your business. My pastor used to say this, when you take care of God's business, he'll take care of your business. And God's business right now is reaching the least, the last, and the lost. Because he's coming soon. Do you believe that? God knows your needs. Number two, not only is God saying no life or gift is too little or too insignificant, but he knows your needs. God notices the least of these. He knows your needs today. He knows my needs today. And by the way, God's not broke, nor is his GPS 
broken. He knows where you are today. He knows what you and your family need. He's got you. But he knows the needs of the world today. He knew the people on that hillside that day were hungry. They were going to need some lunch. They were following him, and they were, hum they were hungry. We've learned at Convoy of Hope that when food security improves, every aspect of that culture improves. When food insecurity is present, people cannot thrive and become what God has intended for them to become. In the developing nations we're working, why do we lead with food? Why do we lead with, with clean water? Because those advances and those basic needs to be met make life better for children. They're not, heads aren't pounding, their stomachs aren't aching. They're not taking naps at lunchtime or recess time. They're actually engaged. And I was thinking, how many young history makers are still begging on street corners yet to discover their God-given purpose because they're still preoccupied with their search for bread? 16,000 children every day is still too many who are perishing. But in the span of my generation, we have cut the number in half in the last 40 years. 40,000 children uh, perished 40 years ago every day. We cut that number in half. And in my lifetime, in the spirit of Matthew 25, when you've done it to the least, you've done it to me. And James 1, the kind of pure religion that pleases the Father. What an offering of worship this would be because all along we did it in a way that pointed people to Jesus. Food and water, building a bridge to say yes to Jesus. So God uses, and here's some stories that, that you should know about. God knows our needs. Here's some Here's a, a lady, her name is Angelica. She lives in El Salvador. She's got twin boys in third grade. This little dude seems to be in trouble because of the way she has her hand around his wrist. And he does not look happy. But she's got a bag of food on her head and carrying it home. This was a Friday afternoon. She's going home with beans, rice, cooking oil, canned meat, some plum organics, some power bars to hold her family over. She told me, she said, thank you because of this bag of food this weekend, I don't have to choose who doesn't get to eat in my home. Can you imagine being a mom put in that position? Her third grade, her boy's third grade teacher told me, he said, Jeff, the food and water have changed the game in our school. And I said, explain to me. He said, well, we used to uh, just let the kids nap. And because they would come sickly and malnourished, and he said, we'd give them about a 50-minute nap, get it together, uh, clean up everything, and then go on with class. He said, now we do recess. And now the kids get a delicious hot meal every single day. And he said, it's a beautiful thing to see. It's changed this school forever. And, and by the way, there are 700 kids at this school. There are 500 kids on the waiting list. There is no discipline problem at this school whatsoever. Here's another picture of the school kids lining up for a big rally where they sang and played and danced for. 700 kids, <clears throat> 10 teachers. Not one problem. None. Moms show up. They used to bring the food in, in big pots and wheelbarrows and walk the food down to feed the kids. Now this school has a kitchen thanks to a church that came and built them a beautiful kitchen. And uh, they can cook it there. They can clean. And uh, all of the pots and pans are there. The mamas and uh, families are no longer cooking the food at home and hauling it over to the school. So it's a beautiful thing, partnership. Next slide. Water purification in Haiti, very, very important uh, part of our feeding initiatives. Next slide. Women's empowerment program. These ladies are recipients of uh, microloans and grants where they learn trades and businesses. They learn how to do life better. And we're feeding their kids, and the goal is to not feed their grandkids. That's the goal. So one day they say, hey, we've got this. We no longer need your help. And we go on to the next place that's waiting to receive help and hope in Jesus' name. Next slide. Kids praying over their meal in Haiti. Next picture. Uh, this little guy, we share the same name. His name is Jeffrey. He flipped out when, we learned, when he learned that I have his name or he has my name. And we became instant friends. We went to this school. We gave out 10 pounds of suckers. The teachers hated us, and we left. <laughs> we got them all sugared up like a good papa now. You know, we have two grandbabies, and uh, Mary and I... And, uh, you know, you just do anything for your kids, right? And so the teacher saw us coming like, great, here's a group of pastors. And, uh, but these kids are like your kids. They're like my kids. They love life. They love food. They love to laugh. They love to play. They love to joke around. 
and they want to know Jesus. They want to know, why am I here on this earth? What's the purpose for my life? Beautiful kids. Next slide. And these, these are some of the kids in the program, just so you get the images and sense of, of who they are and what they do. Next slide, you can see. Uh, and I believe the next slide is our one-day challenge. So I want to introduce you to our president, Hal Donaldson. And in this video, he has a one-day to feed the world challenge for you. Take a look. Jim Palmer said it this way as we close today. He said, telling people that God loves them is good theology. Showing people that you love them is what transforms the world. And you are showing thousands of people that you will probably never meet that you love them. Your one day of kindness, your one day of investing in their lives transforms their every day. We're so grateful. And God knows our needs. Remember, he knows the needs of the world. No gift or life is too little or insignificant. And finally, God always multiplies what we give him. Just like the boy's lunch, he usually does the most with the least. Uh, I'm standing in front of you today from a little town called Pinal, California, next to El Sobrante, which means the leftovers in Spanish. They didn't even know what to name my town, so they named it Corn and Leftovers. <laughs> Pinole and uh, El Sobrante. From the East San Francisco Bay, came to Jesus when I was 18. God put a big vision in my heart. Missions and compassion have always been part of our life as pastors and being on the team at Convoy. I'm just honored to be able to communicate. God's has a sweet, God has a sweet spot for you. He has a sweet spot for people. And he has a sweet spot for people who are marginalized and who have no voice and who don't have basic needs to get through their day. A boy's lunch, really? We serve a God of multiplication. God takes our collective one day's wage and blows it up and blows it out. And here's what's cool. You multiply those gifts by five. So Pastor Eddie, on your Give Sunday or the 14th or the 21st, when you finally get your total, you multiply that by five. That is how much food, water, and supplies CLC and Rala will be purchasing through Convoy of Hope and getting to the needs of people. So it's a celebration day. Just like the boy's lunch, when you place it in his hands, he multiplies what we give him, including our lives, our finances, our hearts, our marriages, our family. Here's what's funny, and I was thinking of this this week. When we plan to feed a lot of people, we start with a lot of food, right? If you're going to have guests over, we're about to do a high school graduation party for our youngest. It's the final and last child in our home that graduates from high school. We're putting all the plans together. And we're going to have people over to the house. We're going to have a little reception. Well, guess what? You've got to have food. You've got to have beverages. You've got to clean the house. You've got to spit shine the deck. 
Well, when we plan to feed a lot of people, we start with a lot of food and end up with a lot less than we, when we started. But listen to this. When God plans to feed a lot of people, he can start with a small amount and end up with a lot more than when he started. That is the God that we serve. Is that crazy? It's crazy to me. It's not natural. It's super natural. God started with five barley loaves, two small fish, had 12 baskets at the end, and fed thousands of people. So God works a lot differently than we do. My final word to you today, among a couple I'm going to use after this, is get out of the boat. Just get out and trust God and say, God, if you said to get out of the boat, it's not natural for me to walk on water, but I'm going to do it. And you become a water walker when you keep your eyes on him and you trust him that he is your source. The miraculous often begins when we willingly give or use what God has already entrusted. Hey, I will give when I get a lot of money. Hey, I'll give when I win the lottery. Hey, I'll give when I can afford to give. You can't not afford to not give in God's God. God will take what you have and multiply it and will blow you away. The small boy gave what he had. God to Moses, God said to Moses, hey, what's in your hand? Elisha to the widow, hey, what do you have in your house? I don't have much. We'll go home. And God just gave this endless supply to that widow found in 2 Kings 4. So today, Proverbs 21, 21, whoever goes hunting for what is right and kind finds life itself, glorious life. Here's a picture of a little dude named Danny, little boy. He's eight years old. He's in the third grade. He goes to school at Escuela Cristo Vienna Program Center in Nicaragua, one of almost a thousand program centers that we resource with food and water. He lives at home with his mom and dad. His mom works from home. His father sells goods at the bus stop. While life is not perfect, it's the little things that make young Danny happy. He says, I am happy to be with my mom and dad and to be able to come to school and do homework and eat good food. He rejoices. He also enjoys the food he receives, uh, especially his favorite food, rice and beans. When, Jer when, when Danny isn't riding, running, or studying with his friends, he's hunting iguanas with his best friend, Jerry. He said, one day, we hunted 10 iguanas. Danny says, smiling. We eat them, we fry them up, or we make iguana soup. Delicious, right? Danny looks up to his older brother, dreams one day of being a police officer. He's very thankful for the food he receives through the one-day program. The food is delicious, he says. Please keep sending food so all the children can have a meal in my country. Your ability to give physical and spiritual food to hungry people is limited not by your lack of having enough to give, but by our lack of giving what we have to give. That's what God's asking us to do today. Finally, this story from God's word, Luke 6, 38. It says, give away your life. You'll find life given back. But not merely given back. Given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. So I'm believing, God, that this church is going to be full of water walkers. And people that just simply say, God, I'm going to trust you with what I have, where I'm at. I'm going to be part of the solution of bringing help and hope to a lot of people. Finally, Matthew 6.20 says, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. There's really two attitudes about giving. I'm going to give all I can or I'm going to keep all I can. But here's what's cool. When you give all you can, you get to keep all you give. Because when you invest in the kingdom of God, the enemy cannot rip it off. He can't break in and steal it. He can't let it destroy what you've given to God. It is set apart in God's economy. The disciples looked at their supply and said, hey, this is impossible. And yet, uh, look what happened when it was placed in God's hands. Wrap it up today and your pastor's going to come. This is a family that means an awful lot to me, sitting on this couch. Summer of 1969, this man and his wife were on their way to a church meeting and were hit head on by a drunken driver, instantly killed the man on the left. The mom on the right was fighting for her life. Deacons, elders, law enforcement showed up at the house 
where the babysitter was babysitting the four children in the middle, knocked on the door, and they informed the children that their dad was in heaven and their mom was fighting for their life. It changed the trajectory forever of these kids' lives. People began to gather, and a law enforcement officer said, if somebody, can somebody take these kids tonight? Because if not, we're going to have to take them down to the station. And one family raised their hands. Bill and Levada Davis, who had three children of their own, brought them home to this place in the same community. So now nine people living in a single wide trailer. And when the mom was well, 10 people living in a single wide trailer for over a year. They showed radical hospitality, radical generosity, radical kindness. You could say they were some of the first water walkers of this series because they began a chain reaction of blessing. These kids remembered bags of groceries showing up at their front porch. They remembered people speaking words of hope and life over them, saying, God's going to use this. God loves you. He cares for you. He has a plan for your life. He remembers people picking them up, the kids do, and taking them to Kenny Shoes to buy not the $3 pair of cons, or the $4 pair, but the $8 pair of Converse. That was a long time ago, right? Who, who spends eight bucks for shoes anywhere anymore? And the kids remember this kindness and hospitality, and it was sown into their life. The seeds of kindness and generosity were sown into them by people around them. Long story short, fast forward, these kids grow up and decide to give back. So they fill the back of a pickup truck full of groceries, and they go through a neighborhood passing out food to people who were kind to them. And it felt so good, they did it again. Convoy of Hope was birthed. That little boy in the middle is this man, Hal Donaldson, the president and CEO of Convoy of Hope. And he was the recipient of one radical act of kindness and generosity. And the other day I was with Hal, and I said, Hal, can you believe that God took this idea and has shared Jesus with 100 million people around the earth, and he just shakes his head in disbelief, and he would say this, only God, Jeff, can do this, only God. So only God will bless you and strengthen you and encourage you as you are generous, as you are kind. I encourage you to take this message to heart today. Pastor Eddie's going to come. We're going to talk a little bit. At your seat, you have, there are two resources. If you just take those right now. And uh, I'm just going to give you a quick little briefing, and Pat Pastor Eddie's going to fill in some blanks. This is for you to take and read on the why, why one day to feed the world. The why behind the what. You can read that sometime today. This is in the next 21 days on the day that you decide to say, I'm going for it. I'm doing one day. You take this sticker off, and you pop it on your shirt, your dress, your sweater, your blouse, your suit, whatever, and you go to work. And today, that day, you're not just going to work, you're on a mission. And say, today I'm working on behalf of the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely that Convoy of Hope serves. Your church is all in with this. And it creates a little buzz. You'll have a chance to minister, witness. Who knows? Somebody else might join you. And you say, yeah, I'm, today I'm working. I'm giving my day's wage to help, help people. And people are going to be like, what? Or good for you, or whatever, I roll whatever it is. But listen, it will create a talking point for you and an opportunity to maybe build a bridge to somebody to say, hey, I got the coolest church in town. You should come this week. Pastor Eddie. 